I have another one that said that the uh, computers on campus won't let her install the lockdown browser. And the computers on campus already has a lockdown browser, that's why it won't let her install it. Ah, very good. Oh, thank you. That's a good answer. <laughs> Already. And if she finds one that doesn't, she needs to like let somebody know so that it can be installed. Okay, good. So, because um, I have one student with a MacBook that keeps saying she can't get in. And I, I've already explained about Chromebooks. Um, yeah, don't use a Chromebook. Don't use a Chromebook. Use a real computer. And, uh, Chromebooks have lockdown browser too. They just have to download it from the Play Store. Right. So and install it. Uh, so it works just fine on Chromebooks too. I know, but it's easier to tell people not to use a Chromebook than you know, because you can't you can't get them to to walk through that process. It's come on. It's like it's like it's like trying to get the faculty to do something. You know that. Come on, you you put up with me for years. Um. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can find. Let me see what I can find on the MacBook. So you can have a little thing of what you have to do. I can get it to work, and I will email it to you. Yes, because I'm get, I'll be in class in another ten minutes. So, uh, but I, right. I I love to read. I love to read emails during my break. So, but I would appreciate that. Okay, and I, I will do that. My computer ever decides I'm allowed to like open Chrome. Okay. Yeah, I've got I had another question, but I can't remember what it is. When I, when, it, when it surfaces, I'll send you an email. So right. hey, thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay, see ya.
<clears throat> okay, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started here. We're going to hopefully going to wrap up uh, this chapter today. We like to get that done. And we're going to pick up with um, enzymes. Uh, exciting topic, but um, yeah, it is what it is. Anyway, uh, if you have any questions on anything, now's a good time to, to uh, uh, shout them out, raise them, send me an email, whatever you want to do, um, and I will get back to you. I've been should have answered everybody's questions over the past day. I think I think I got them all. I did not get them done today. So if um, anybody has anything to say, this is great. I'll, otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, the lecture. Okay, then I'm going to go into share screen and find, here we go. Let's see, somewhere around looking at proteins and enzymes. Okay, we're going to start with enzymes. That's a good place to. Um, Start. Now, the reason I'm starting here in enzymes is because this, this is a really important uh, topic for us. Enzymes are proteins. All enzymes are proteins. They function as a catalyst. A catalyst makes chemical reactions go faster at very, very low concentrations and low temperatures and, and low particle sizes. So, you know, we're sort of stuck in the body, can't adjust the particle size, can't adjust the, the concentration, uh, can barely adjust the temperature, and then only in special circumstances, and then only for a couple of degrees. You know, uh, low grade fevers, for example, are the result of temperature adjustment because we work better at killing bacteria and slightly higher body temperatures. So an enzyme is a globular protein. We can't affect chemical reactions in our bodies with raising temperature, increasing the concentration, or uh, using smaller and smaller, smaller particles. We're, we're, we're pretty much locked in with all that. What we can do is flood the area where a chemical reaction is going to take place with millions of enzymes. And, it, and so we actually lower the energy needed for a reaction to occur. And what do I mean by that? Well, chemical reactions occur when two reactants, two or more reactants, bounce into each other. All these particles are moving. They're moving around. If they're in solution, they're moving around. If they're in the air, they're moving around even if they're mixed together as a powder. Sometimes that's how they are. Or as two gases or as two liquids, they're always moving around. The amount of moving around is caused by random energy, the energy that the molecules contain. If they're in the air, you know, they're bouncing around. A you know, simple diffusion in the air works because these particles are just randomly bouncing around within the air. Now, the odds of them running into another particle, another reactant, are very, very low just through random uh, use of energy. And so, it, and it takes a lot of energy for a particle to keep bouncing around until it runs into its reactant uh, partner uh, for a reaction to occur. That's how reactions occur anyway. Particles run into each other and a reaction occurs. A catalyst makes that happen faster, so we spend less energy. If you, if you have you know, 10 particles react at A and 10 particles react at B in a chamber that's 100 meters on the side, so it's a big, great big chamber. It's like you know, our classroom size you know, or, or bigger, you know, or maybe an auditorium or maybe a gymnasium. It's a huge area, and these these 10 particles of each are randomly bouncing around inside here. It's going to take forever for those particles to come in, to, to come together. But if you flood that same area with 
a trillion enzyme particles. So all they have to do is grab the, the, two, the, the two reactants and force them together. That reaction is going to go very quickly. And so what an enzyme does, an enzyme is designed, every, every, enzymes are designed to cause certain types of reactions to occur. They are globular proteins with what we call an active site on them. And that active site is specific just for certain um, reactants. And so if we're trying to break down, let me go back to the slide. Um, back on the there we go. If we have the picture here, you see you know, of starch. Starch um, is what we, you know, we eat. We eat a potato, or we eat a, a donut, or we eat a bowl of cereal. We have the starchy product in our mouth while we're chewing it. And while we're chewing it, there's an enzyme in our saliva called amylase. And amylase will only fit onto starch, or rather starch will only fit onto amylase. Nothing else will fit on amylase except starch. So the starch uh, molecules will fit on what we call the active sites of the amylase and be ripped apart. We break them, we will break this, the, the, the long chain of starches. You know, starch consists of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of glucose molecules in a straight line. When starch is exposed to amylase, amylase starts breaking it down into a double sugar, into a disaccharide right away. Sucrose, for example or maltose. Yeah, or, um, so we're, we're going to uh, break, the, break these uh, this long um, uh, starch molecule down into double, just regular double sugars. And there we can break the double sugars down later on into sim uh, simple sugars like glucose. So this is what how an enzyme works. The enzyme will only work on certain reactants. We say it is substrate specific. The reactants are what we call the substrate. The reactants are the substrate. They land on what we call the active sites on the enzyme. Nothing else can land there. Nothing else can fit there except those reactants. You know, it won't work on any other, react, any other reactants. Now we'll have millions of enzymes for every possible chemical reaction that takes place in our bodies. It doesn't matter what the reaction is, we'll have an enzyme for it. So it is very, very specific. Otherwise, we would never have chemical reactions taking place. They certainly, certainly wouldn't occur at, at the speeds that we need them in our bodies. Now, a problem with enzymes and a problem with any of the globular proteins is that they become denatured. They, they change their shape and can't reform into their old shape. Uh, and higher body temperatures alter the shape of uh, enzymes. It causes them to twist around. It changes the, the, their active site around so that it's no longer receptive to certain enzymes. So every enzyme is having their active site altered by temperature. There's a structural change to the molecule and it becomes useless. An example of this is where, you know, if you fry an egg, uh, the egg white is transparent when it comes out of the eggshell, but once it heats up, it turns white. The egg white, why we call it the egg white, <clears throat> and it doesn't go back. It has been denatured. It's at the, the egg white is albumin. It's a globular protein. We see it all the time in our, in our plasma, but we can't convert egg white back to uh, the uh, globular version. It is now solidified. It has changed its shape. It's changed its color, and it is useless for what it was going to do. So we can't reverse that kind of reaction. Now in our bodies, we have a little flexibility in temperature, and we have a little flexibility in pH. Sometimes our pH goes up, sometimes it goes down. Sometimes our temperature goes up, sometimes it goes down. So any kind of very small scale uh, 
events where the enzyme is being slightly denatured, it can reverse itself. But we are very sensitive to um, chemical changes. When a person is experiencing a cardiac event, the, um, we see in a, a sense that if the heart has stopped, blood is not being pumped around in the lungs. Okay, the heart's not pumping anymore. The, that blood is, con contains carbon dioxide. Where did the carbon dioxide come from? Well, it takes time for all the cells in the body to die. Muscle cells uh, take a long, long time for them to, for in the individual cells to die. And uh, heart muscle cells take about an hour and brain cells take about five minutes. All these cells are individually, many of them are still alive. And many of them are drawing on the oxygen reserves that are still in our blood and drawing on that, that oxygen and, undergo, and, and generating carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide is entering the blood like it's supposed to. That carbon dioxide combines with the carbon dioxide that was already there and it's forming carbonic acid. Well, we're not getting rid of the CO2. That blood is, you know, the C, we're not going to the lungs because the heart's not beating. We're still getting rid of the carbon dioxide. We're not getting rid of the carbon dioxide. So our blood is becoming more and more acidic. As we, as our, as the pH value lowers, the acid concentration is increasing and it's busy destroying enzymes throughout our body. And you know, one of the things to counteract that is to try and neutralize the acidity. Sodium bicarbonate is added to an individual's um, uh, plasma uh, to neutralize this, this spike in carbonic acid because on top of everything else with the heart not uh, pumping, uh, and the brain cells uh, thinking about dying, you know, you're also killing cells by seeing a, 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 uh, uh, an increase in the acidity. Cells don't like that. Enzymes don't like that. Enzymes start breaking down. And so you, uh, you have to try and, and neutralize that. Because if you get past a certain point, and I'm, and I'm sure every enzyme is gonna be different, when you go past a certain point on temperature and pH, either up or down, on either one, up or, up or down in temperature, up or down in pH, the, the cell has irreversible damage. So, so we say that an enzyme is a catalyst because it makes chemical reactions go faster. The enzyme itself isn't used up in the reaction. All it does is simply bring reactants together. That's all an enzyme does. The enzyme will bring uh, reactant A and reactant B together. We call them the substrates. They land on the enzyme's active site, and then a reaction occurs. And then they let go of the product. And that's all an enzyme does. It goes and does it again and again and again. It's the only thing our bodies do can do to make a reaction go much faster and spend a whole lot less energy. Now, an enzyme, if it has an ASE ending, that, that's its suffix, if you remember the grammar rules, the substrate, um, the enzyme ends in an ASE. So we see it, it's an oxidase or a catalase or a hydrolase or whatever type of reaction it's going to do, whatever you're going to make, that's what the enzyme does. So oxidases are very important to us. Uh, you know, what we, what we can do with these enzymes is that they will cause a chemical reaction to occur at a faster rate. And again, they're very, very specific. They often use vitamins in their makeup to allow the rea a reaction to go faster. Now, this is an important point. Vitamins are often considered coenzymes. They, vitamins are not enzymes. They're not little enzymes. They're not wannabe enzymes. They are not an assistant enzyme. They are just a part of the enzyme. We call it a, uh, they are a coenzyme. Uh, they are just an organic molecule added to the enzyme to make the whole thing work together. Sometimes enzymes have metal 
ion, so that we call that a cofactor. So, but every enzyme is going to react to a very specific substrate, the reactants. The reactants are very specific. It's okay, because we've got lots of enzymes we can make. What an enzyme does, as I said, is lowers the activation energy, meaning we don't have to wait randomly for two uh, reactants to bounce around in, in our bodies or in the air or in water to randomly run in together. The, um, the enzyme will grab those reactants and force them together just by landing, landing them side by side you know, on, you know, on, on their active site. And then we release the product. So what happens is that by putting all these, you know, putting a, a, a trillion enzymes into a, lo into a location where a reaction is trying to occur, the reaction occurs rapidly. We didn't have to heat anything up or increase the concentration or um, change the particle size because we can't. But the reaction occurs very quickly thanks to the presence of the enzymes. If the enzymes are inhibited in any way, then the reactions are going to start shutting down. They're not going to work. And this is why it's very, very, very important for us to maintain constant temperature and a constant pH, because if we start seeing our enzymes shut down, then chemical reactions that we need are not going to occur. An enzyme is a protein that changes the rate of polar That was a lot of work for a, a little bit of uh, information there. So this is a, a, a real simple but um, pretty good diagram. Uh, that you can, you know, sort of maybe commit to memory on how an enzyme works. And there's your enzyme with its active site. For example, this is how we make proteins. We take an enzyme and bring two amino acids together. Proteins are all made out of amino acids. And so we can bring two amino acids together and form the peptide bond that holds them together. And then we can do it again and again and again. And so nothing happens to the enzyme. The enzyme you start with here is the same one you start with here, finish with here. But we've taken our substrates and joined them together in, at the, on the active sites of the enzyme. The active sites are specific to the substrates. The reactants, the substrates, what the only certain ones can fit on certain enzymes. So the amino acids are not gonna fit on the amylase enzyme. And you're not gonna be able to string uh, to bring two amino acids together and have them form with a peptide bond on amylase. All amylase can do is allow starch to land on it. That's all. And, it will, and all that does is take the starch and break it apart into, into maltose uh, molecules. Doesn't do a thing for uh, putting together amino acids. So, and the enzyme for amino acids doesn't do a thing for starch. They're all gonna be specific. Now the shape of the, mole of the uh, substrate is designed to fit in the active site on the enzyme. If it doesn't, if it doesn't fit, it's not going to work. So when it gets denatured, it's the the substrates aren't the reactants don't fit the active sites anymore. This is what happens whether when we change the shape of the active sites by temperature or acidity. So our, our reactants, the substrates, 
the, act, the small molecules are the substrates. The active sites are where the substrates land, and then they combine with a, with a bond, like, like amino acids. If you denature the enzyme, you change the shape of the active site. And if it's not reversed, or if it can't be reversed, then the enzyme no longer allows the reactant reaction to occur because the reactants, the substrates, aren't going to fit in the active site anymore. So that way it's done. And so that, that reaction will stop. And the reaction may be something that we need. It usually is something we need, and usually something we need right away. So. Okay. So the most important thing, you know, to remember about uh, proteins is that we use them structurally and uh, we use them functionally. We use them as muscles. Uh, we use them as uh, connecting, you know, connecting as, as tendons. Um, you know, the uh, muscle protein is um, contractile protein. The muscle cells have lots of contractile protein in them. That's the fibrous protein. Uh, we also have lots of collagen. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body, and it connects uh, muscles to bone in, in the form of tendons. We also see the globular proteins, like the hormones and the enzymes. You know, again, much more sensitive to changes in temperature and in pH. So that leads us into a list. I understand, uh, Dustin, it's okay. So, okay, uh, let's now. The last category here is uh, the nucleic acids. Nucleic acids uh, are the DNAs and the RNAs. They're also made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, they also have uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in them. They are extraordinarily large and long molecules. Uh, a DNA molecule, for example, can be about six feet long. They're made up of polymer of monomers. They're still called polymers. The monomers here are called nucleotides. Nucleotides. And a nucleotide has a nitrogen base a five carbon pentose sugar, pento means five, or pent means five, and a phosphate group. So you have a, a nitrogenous base, a pentose sugar, and a phosphate group. And the two types of nucleic acids are the DNAs and the RNAs. This is what a nucleotide looks like. It is a sugar and a phosphate group and a base. Here's the phosphate group out here. Here's the sugar here. And there's a nitrogenous base. And there are only, there are only five possible nitrogenous bases. We have uh, cytosine, we have uh, thymine, we have uracil, we have adenine, and we have guanine. Those are the five types of nitrogenous bases. And the, um, the two types of sugars are either um, deoxyribose or ribose. They're both five carbon sugars. The deoxyribose is in the DNA, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And the ribose sugar is in the RNA, the ribonucleic acid. But they all are made of these nucleotides with a phosphate, with a phosphate and a five carbon sugar and a nitrogenous base right here. Now, the, of, the, of the two, they're both the DNA and the RNA are very, very important. The DNA is used as our genetic makeup. It is our blueprint. It is, it, it is the instructions. It contains the instructions on how to make us. It is the makeup of all information about us. 
It is a, a DNA molecule, is a double helix, a double stranded molecule uh, woven in a circular pattern. It looks like a spiral staircase or a, a very long ladder that's been twisted into a spiral. Uh, it contains, uh, it's made up of nucleotides that are joined together. Uh, and there are, of the five nitrogen bases, four are used in the DNA. You use adenine and guanine, cytosine and thymine. And the nitrogen bases form complementary bonds across the helix. So you imagine uh, a ladder and the rungs of the ladder are made up on each end of the rung, on, the, on, each, on each side of the ladder at the rung, there is a nitrogen base. And they join together and, and, and bond in the middle of, of, the, of, the, of the rung and the ladder. It's a bad analogy. But what I'm saying, but, and, the, and the bonding is complementary. So what happens here is that the base adenine will always pair up with the base thymine. And the base guanine always pairs with the cytosine. It is what we call complementary base pairing. Adenine always goes to thymine, always. And guanine always goes to cytosine. And it is very, very specific. So in our DNA strand, our DNA strand is held together by, by bonding that occur, by hydrogen bonds that occur between the bases. So this is what the, this is what the double helix, double stranded helix looks like. Um, it, we call it a double because this side is a spiral and the other side is a spiral. Now, when I say it forms the rungs of a ladder, if you imagine this as untwisted, that's a straight ladder. And you took a ladder and you could twist the ladder into, into a spiral shape, it would look like this. The rungs of the ladder are these structures here. These are the, the bases on the nucleotides. Each one of these bases here, like there's adenine and there's thymine, there's, there is guanine, there is uh, cytosine over here. Each one of these bases represents the base of a nucleotide and they are joined together with hydrogen bonds. Adenine always pairs to thymine. Thymine always pairs to adenine. Guanine always pairs to cytosine, always. Unless there's a mistake somewhere and the mistake rate is something like one in a billion, um, which is very, very low. Um, the, uh, if, the mistake, if a mistake does occur, it, it's very, very low. And our DNA strands have special molecules that zip up and down the strand looking for mistakes so they can fix them. They, they really do. Um, so you have this, this complementary pairing of the bases between adenine and thymine and cytosine and guanine. And what causes the molecule to twist like this is the hydrogen bonding that occurs between the complementary bases. When adenine binds to thymine, the hydrogen bonds that occur between the two bases cause the molecule to twist. And it happens at every pairing. They twist, they twist, they twist, and the whole molecule is eventually twisted into its double helix shape. Now, RNA is similar to DNA. It is a, it's not a double helix, it's a single helix. It is a single strand molecule. Uh, it can be in a helix, it can be in a straight line. A lot of times we see it as a, as a helix also. Um, it is a ribose sugar, not a deoxyribose, so it's not missing an, an oxygen. We replace thiamine, you know, thiamine goes in, Thymine is replaced with the uh, base uracil. And DNA occurs in three varieties. You have what's known as messenger RNA, 
which does all the heavy, which really becomes the basis for making a protein. The messenger RNA does the heavy lifting, carrying the instructions on how to make a protein out of the nucleus. And you have transfer RNA, which helps assemble the protein, because proteins are made up of amino acids. So the transfer RNA will bring the amino acids to the messenger RNA to put the protein together. And then we have what's known as ribosomal RNA. The site of assembly is called the ribosome. And most of the ribosome is made up of RNA, ribosomal RNA. Okay, a couple of observations here. Uh, first of all, let me check this. Uh, okay. So if you're not hearing the videos, um, if you go into that, you can you can watch these videos in the PowerPoints yourself. So if you because the PowerPoints are available uh, in eLearn. If you look at the PowerPoint, you can watch you can watch it on your own computer. You know, I never know if they're gonna if they're gonna work or not for anybody. So, but they're they're not bad. They summarize a lot of what I was saying. So if you can't hear um, these um, videos, then they will work. You know. So I'm just bringing up the PowerPoint and looking at watching it here. If you can't hear it, then um, you can watch it on your own at home on your own PowerPoints. Okay. Now, observations here. A gene. A gene is nothing more than the physical location on the DNA strand for the instructions on a particular protein, whether it's hair color, eye color, skin color blood type, um, 
something as hard hitting as whether or not your earlobes dangle or are attached. That's a, that's a trait controlled by a gene. Your earlobes dangle or they do not dangle. Uh, something as simple as whether or not when you put your hands together and your thumbs overlap. If your left thumb overlaps your right thumb, that's a dominant gene. If your right thumb overlaps the, the left thumb, that's a recessive gene. Dominant genes are dominant because they tend to win out. So, but all these things, there's all sorts of things about our bodies that, you know, everything is controlled by our DNA. So the genes are locations on the DNA strand that control all of these traits we have. You know, how tall we're going to be, what our body stature is, what our hair color is, what our uh, physical appearance is going to be. You know, when you when people say, well, you look just like your mother, your father, your grandfather, or something like that. Again, all controlled by our DNA. And the genes in the DNA are nothing more than the physical location of the instructions that make those traits show up. That's all they are. So the term gene is really, it's sort of misleading because it implies it's something really, really uh, important. Well, it is important, but the gene is nothing more than the, the section on the DNA strand that provides the information on a particular trait. And there are multiple copies of that information through, scattered throughout our DNA. We don't just depend on one location only for hair color or eye color or skin color or body stature or all the important enzymes that we need and the proteins we need. We have many, many places here in our DNA with the same information encoded. So we don't, we don't, as they say, we don't put all of our genes in one basket. That was a terrible point, I apologize. So anyway, but the DNA and RNA uh, strands are very similar. The RNA strand is a single strand as opposed to a double strand on the DNA. The only difference, the other difference being a single strand, the other difference is that the RNA strand uses uracil instead of thymine. Don't know why, but it does. Yeah. It's thymine and uracil are similar, but we use uracil instead of thymine in the RNA strand. It's, it functions just fine. Now, it, it isn't so much the, the, um, the type of DNA, the type of base isn't so important but the cluster of the, the bases. Bases show up in clusters of three. The clusters of the, uh, the uh, a cluster of three bases is called a codon on the DNA. It's called a codon. And each codon represents an amino acid. So what DNA does for us is DNA functions as a giant instruction manual, a cookbook if you will, uh, an operating manual for our bodies. And the, the DNA strand is made up of all of these nucleotides list, uh, strung together in, in strands six feet long. So you've got billions of nucleotides in each DNA molecule. The order of the basis in each in, in the strand is important only in the sense that if we take the bases in clusters of three, very specific clusters of three, that represents the amino acids necessary to make a protein. Because a protein is nothing but a long strand of amino acids. Like hemoglobin, the DNA, contain, the genes for hemoglobin contain the order of all the amino acids you're going to see in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has 360 amino acids. The number six amino acid is glutamic acid, one out of the 20. And if, as long as glutamic acid is in the number six spot, you're going to make hemoglobin that works just fine. But if by chance you substitute in valine at the number six spot instead of glutamic acid, your hemoglobin is sickle cell hemoglobin and you reduce the ability of that hemoglobin to carry oxygen by about 
And the substitution of valine for glutamic acid is controlled by the, the DNA. The DNA is sickle cell DNA. And so it makes, it makes a tremendous difference in here. The order of the bases are, you know, the order of the bases uh, dictates what the um, what amino acids are going to be put into um, the uh, in the gene. You know, what what base? What um, I mean, each each amino acid is identified by a cluster of three bases. And so the cluster of three bases represents each individual amino acid that has to come together to make the protein. And if you make a mistake, if, if a mistake is made, then you're going to get the wrong amino acid put in there. Now, we'll talk a lot more about that uh, when we get into uh, chapter three. So the, the sequence is pretty important for us. But as I said, we don't, uh, we have a lot of redundancy. We don't allow, we, you know, we allow for mistakes because we have lots of, lo lots of gene locations throughout our DNA. So if a mistake occurs at one place, it won't affect us. Unfortunately, in sickle cell, it turns out that all of the DNA for hemoglobin becomes defective. Yeah. I just said that. Okay. So we'll talk a lot more about uh, the DNA structures um, in uh, chapter three on cells. I wanna to go touch here briefly on ATP. ATP is what we use to transfer chemical energy around our bodies. Now we obtain our chemical energy from glucose. We break the chemical, we break the covalent bonds in glucose. Break the covalent bonds in glucose, and that releases energy. It's oxidation. We oxidize glucose. It's like burning a candle or burning a match or burning a log, or burning gasoline. When we do that, we release energy. Every time we break covalent bonds, we release energy and we release electrons. When we release energy from glucose, we can capture it temporarily in a molecule of ATP, because that's how we transfer it around to the cells in places where they need it. We just can't randomly release energy and say, hey, here's energy. We transfer it to a, a, a large molecule known as ATP, which is very similar in structure to the DNAs and the RNAs. Um, and we use that molecule as the vehicle with its ATP attached to it to transfer the, the energy around. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, it is a nucleotide. It is similar to RNA and we use it to power, you know, all activities in our bodies that require energy like moving muscles, pumping our heart, generating uh, nerve impulses. Everything that requires energy, we, we use ATP to take the energy out of, away from the glucose. We burn the glucose, we release the energy, and we capture it to do things. It, um, consider you have a, uh, you are simply, you're parking, you, you park the energy in the ATP molecule uh, for use later. You're charging your phone. You plug your phone into the wall. You're, you're taking electrical energy out of the wall, putting it into your battery in your phone. You have increased the potential energy of your phone by charging it to 100%. And you're gonna use that throughout the day and then you'll recharge it again overnight. This is what cells do. Cells take energy out of glucose, sort of like the electric, like we take energy from, from the electrical grid coming, you know, that we plug into the, into the outlet and energy from the grid comes into our phone. Well, we take energy from glucose and it goes into our ATP and it's parked there. And we can use that energy later on. 
course, later on for ATP is about seven seconds. So uh, ATP molecules only stay charged for seven seconds, but seven seconds, as far as the cell is concerned, is an awful lot of time. And so we get to do things with that in that seven seconds. And we're constantly reloading ATP over and over and over again. So ATP gets discharged, charges up again, discharged, charges up again. It can last for seven seconds. So we can't store it very long, but we can store it. So this is what ATP looks like. It has the uh, ribose sugar. It has phosphates on the end of it, and it has the um, adenosine base. So it's similar in structure to a, a nucleotide from RNA, but it has three phosphates on it. That's why it's called adenosine triphosphate. The third phosphate is what's going to do the work for us. The third phosphate joins the rest of the nucleotide whenever there's energy available. It takes energy to force that third phosphate on uh, the molecule. You can see here, there's the third phosphate. It will only join to the ADP. It joins the adenosine diphosphate when there's energy available to form a bond to hold the third phosphate on. That high energy bond will last for seven seconds. And wherever the ATP molecule goes, it, when that bond breaks, it can release that energy to do something, pump blood, breathe, send an, a nerve impulse, you know, raise your arm, lower your arm, scratch your nose, whatever. So we carry the energy around in this ATP molecule. As soon as the, the bond is broken, we revert back to inorganic phosphate, that has a little phosphate floating around out here. And we have the ADP, the diphosphate, called diphosphate, because there's a part two phosphates here. But when we get energy again, we re we reestablish that bond. And now we've got a fully charged molecule ready to go out and do something for seven seconds. And it goes ATP goes back and forth between its high energy ATP version and its lower energy ADP. Whenever we get energy from oxidizing glucose, we make ATP. When we break that high energy bond, we end up with what we call an inorganic phosphate and adenosine diphosphate. So the bond just broke. There's the inorganic phosphate. There's the adenosine diphosphate. But we get more energy from glucose. We form the bond. And now we can go do something again. So, okay, we are finally done with chemistry. It only took us four weeks to get here. So um, now what I'd like to do, uh, yeah, this. Um, this means we can have a test. I'm sure you're, yay, that's exciting. Uh, I'm a, once the lab exams are all over, uh, probably on the 21st, which is next Tuesday, I think, uh, I'll probably open up the first lecture exam the follow, next week and uh, I mean, open up on the, the next day and leave it open for 10 days. So, and the lockdown browser is in place on all the exams now. I know people have been having issues with lock, lockdown browser. Um, I know that, um, that cameras haven't worked right. I don't understand why that's happening, uh, why the camera isn't working. Uh, it makes no sense. You know, you know, people have reported brand new computers and the camera's not being recognized. I don't know why. I've talked to my technical guy at uh, Severeville and he's looking into it. I know that if you try to load, uh, if, if you uh, use one of the computers in the library and try to load lockdown browser on there, it'll say no, because it's already installed. So all you have to do is go ahead and take it. Uh, it is use it. At least that's what I've been told. Um, I know that Chromebooks have a real issue with lockdown browsers. I also, but I do know that uh, there is an app that you can uh, add to your Chromebook just found out about that today. 
that there is an app that will let you do a workaround with the lockdown browser. So if you have a Chromebook and you want to try that, look, you know, that, that would be fine. But uh, we've, we've always been told that uh, Chromebooks have it, Chromebooks have, usually have a hard time with lockdown browsers. Anyway, um, so I think but if you have questions about trying to get in, let me know. No one's going to get hung up. I'm not going to let anybody get hung up because the lockdown browser is giving them problems. I will find out what the problem is and get it fixed. Anyway, I'd like to take a little time now and start chapter three on um, uh, the cells, which is where th this is probably one of the most, the driest and, and least interesting chapters. We're going to start getting better as we go along as we're going to get more and more relevant to the human body. So just bear with me as we go through this. So let me uh, find the... Uh, there we go. Okay, let's see if I can go in here and comment. Oh, I didn't know that would happen. If you if you, if you put your hand in your face, like if you you know you rub your nose or something, and, and you would get dinged by that. Uh, hmm. So. Well, I guess because we can't tell, the computer can't tell what's going on. Um, so I know my wife goes to WGU and takes her exams online and they have live proctors. I know that she has to have everything moved out of the room. And uh, if she even sneezes or looks down, they may, you know, if the proctor is in a bad mood, they may just yank her test right there. So. Okay, uh, let's go on to chapter three, the cells. Okay. So we're all made of cells. We're made of billions and billions of cells. Everything, every living organism, plant and animal and fungus, and bacteria and human are made of cells. Viruses aren't made of cells. Viruses are just particles. A virus is just a strand, of, uh, a partial strand of DNA or RNA wrapped around with a, with a protein coat wrapped around it. Viruses are not alive. So we don't kill viruses, we just destroy them. It's sort of a you know, technicality here, but they are not a living structure. All a virus is programmed to do is to find a host and take over the host. And when it takes over the host, make millions of copies of itself. That's why we, you know, one of the reasons why we wear a mask, uh, particularly the N95s, is that if we, ha if we have a virus, we're spewing the viral particles out every time we breathe. And if someone else is spewing out viral particles, at least the N95 mask does a better job in preventing them from being inhaled. So, okay. So we know that every living thing is made up of cells. We know that cells are the basic unit of life. Only living organisms have cells. So the cell theory, the, the cell theory which was developed about 150 years ago, said three, three things. All organisms are made of cells. Cells are the basic unit of life. And most importantly, living cells only come from other living cells. We don't make life anywhere. Life only comes from life. Living cells come from living cells. There are 200 different types of cells in the human body. They all have different sizes and shapes and functions. Um, they have um, the, the contents in the cytoplasm are all different. You know, red cells have nothing but hemoglobin inside there. No nucleus, no organelles, no nothing. You know, other cells are very, you know, they're all going to be specific as to what they do. They're all, they all have everything except, has, except red cells has a nucleus. Every nucleus contains all of our DNA. 
that regardless of what kind of um, cell it is, if it has a nucleus, all of our genetic information is contained in that nucleus. It's not all turned on, but it's there. If we look at a cell, a um, what we say the generalized cell, a model of a cell, regardless of what it looks like, whether it's four feet long or whether it is uh, one cell layer, you know, it represents a one cell layer thick structure. It's all going to, except for the, the red cells, the blood cells, it's all going to have the same three parts. It's going to have a membrane, a plasma membrane. It's going to have cytoplasm, the goop inside the cell membrane. You know, where it's the term now is starting to uh, move from cytoplasm to cytosol. 80 years ago, uh, they were called, it was called protoplasm. That gradually evolved into cytoplasm. Now we're calling it cytosol. So terms change all the time. Going to have plasma membrane, cytoplasm, and a nucleus, which contains the DNA. Other than red cells, every cell in our bodies are going to have all three of these structures. So the plasma membrane, the cell membrane, you saw this picture from lab. Every cell is going to have a membrane that surrounds it. It's going to uh, separate the fluid outside the cell from the fluid inside the cell. The cells are bathed in interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is essentially plasma that leaks out from the capillaries and blood vessels. Those blood vessels are leaky. That plasma, uh, when it leaves the blood, becomes this interstitial fluid that covers the outside of all of our cells. Eventually, that interstitial fluid is collected by the lymphatic system and returned going through the lymph nodes to, for filtering and, and cleaning up, return to the blood and becomes plasma again. Same water. It's salt water, salt water, salt water. Salt water is plasma. Salt water is interstitial fluid. Salt water is lymphatic fluid. And salt water as back as plasma. But it, so it's all the same. It's all about its location. But the cells are very picky about what gets into them. So they have a membrane. And that membrane is what we say selectively permeable. It keeps the outside water from coming into the cell. It keeps the water in the cell, the intracellular fluid, from going out. So we generally don't have any mixing of the waters. Now, water will come into a cell and water will leave a cell, but it's a very specific process. There are specialized passageways for water to go in and water to go out. But generally, water doesn't, the amount of water inside the cell and outside the cell doesn't change. And they usually, usually don't mix. But the fluid, the interstitial fluid, contains the glucose, contains the oxygen, contains the um, uh, waste products from the cell, contains the carbon dioxide from the cell going back to the blood. So these fluids are a medium for uh, the, this interstitial fluid is a medium for wastes and uh, to leave a cell and nutrients and oxygen to come into the cell. Because usually, and these capillaries, you know, this interstitial fluid is leaking out of the capillaries. The tiniest vessels in our body are called capillaries. And every capillary is in contact with a cell. You know, uh, every cell in our bodies is in contact with at least one capillary. Um, lung cells in the lungs have up to 100 capillaries. The capillaries don't connect directly into the cell, but since they are adjacent to it, material leaves the cell, leaves the capillary through uh, in the plasma leaks out of the capillary. The capillary, uh, the contents of the capillary, the, the sugars, the salts, uh, the water, the nutrients, uh, the hormones leak out in the water, in the plasma. The cells don't leak out, but the water does. The water contains all this good stuff and goes to the cell, which is right next door. And then the cell picks up what it wants, the, 
the salt, uh, the potassium, the glucose, uh, and the oxygen. And then the cell gives up its carbon dioxide, it gives up its waste products, it gives up its broken cell fragments, and they move back into the blood. And so it moves, you know, the, the, this fluid medium layer between the cell and the uh, blood vessel, very, very tiny, but everything has to go through this interstitial layer. So, so this is what a cell looks like. The cell membrane controls entry into the cell and exit from the cell. Stuff doesn't randomly just, I'm gonna leave the cell today uh, or new stuff's coming in. So there's a lot of things going on with the cell. The membrane can, can surrounds the cytoplasm of the cell and within the cytoplasm are lots of smaller structures called organelles. Those are um, structures that are designed for certain types of activities. For example, these orange things here are mitochondria. Mitochondria are organelles that allow glucose to be oxidized down to carbon dioxide and water with the release of energy that gets grabbed in ATP. It only takes, you know, it takes place in large quantities inside these mitochondria. This green structure over here is called the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus takes proteins and will sort them out into their various types of proteins. Because when proteins get made, uh, the, the, this protein, the protein manufacture takes place in this structure here called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And all the proteins that are getting made there get dumped into the Golgi just in mass. The Golgi sorts everything out. You know, it's the OCD component uh, of the cell. So it sorts all these proteins out and collects, you know, proteins of a light nature. You know, all the amylase, for example, goes here, and all the proteases go here, and all the actin goes here. So and all these start all this these different types of proteins are collected and then released by the Golgi apparatus. So you're, you know, like when you're releasing proteins here, for example, it's all the same protein. So uh, cells are very, very specific in what they do. So the plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. It, it consists of the phospholipids we talked about in, in the lipid section. You know, it has a phosphate head and two fatty acid tails. And it's arrayed with the tail. Uh, since it's a bilayer, it's two layers of phospholipids with the tails pointing inward. And it's a very squishy layer. It's like, um, it is like trying to walk on a uh, trampoline surface. It moves up and down, it rebounds all the time. Uh, it's very flexible. And embedded in this layer, we have lots of proteins that are openings that let stuff in, special, specialized openings that will let some things come into the cell, let other things go out of the cell. And the membrane, these membrane proteins embedded in the surface are also very squishy and they float. So the membrane surface is bouncing up and down and there are things embedded in the surface that are floating through the membrane all the time. Imagine a water balloon, you know how squishy a water balloon is before you throw it. Okay. Not that anybody would, but you have this water balloon. And so take that water balloon and dip it into a container of corn oil. So it's covered with corn oil all, all over the surface. Now roll it in, in a, uh, bowl of or cover it with lucky charms. I pick lucky charms because um, the, the the shapes of the cereal and all the little marshmallow pieces in there all look different. Now imagine this balloon covered with lucky charms floating on this oil layer here so that as the water balloon ooze lay, you know squishes around the contents on the surface are sliding across the membrane of, of the balloon. That's what our cells are like. The membrane's constantly in motion. 
this, the, the structures embedded in the surface of the balloon are constantly moving around all the time. Now, but those are important to us. There are structures on the surface called a glycocalyx. That is a, essentially a sugar-coated protein. The glycocalyx identifies that cell as us. All of our cells have glycocalyx structures that are identifiers. We call them antigens. And those are the identifiers that tell us that we are who we are. And glycocalyx structures determine the are, 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 are determine the basis of blood typing. And what blood type do we have? Well, we have an identifier on every cell telling us what it is. Just like any of our any of our tissues have the same identifier telling us what that tissue is. Yeah, so we can very quickly identify foreign substances, whether it's uh, a, uh, a virus, a bacteria, uh, a fungus, a transplanted tissue, for, for example, we can identify all that. Now our cells stick together. Our cells stick together through what are known as cell junctions. The cells are glued together along their edges. And there are junctions. There are different types of junctions that hold the cell together. Some are woven, some are riveted, some are actually have holes punched in them so that the cell can communicate rapidly from one cell to another through an opening deep in the cell. Key term here is unaided. Yeah. Uh, anything the membrane is essentially made of of, uh, of fat. You know, it is a uh, phospholipid bilayer. So these are the fatty acid chains here and here with the phosphate heads. Anything that is fat soluble can slide right through this membrane. Water can't get in because it water and and, and lipids uh, don't mix. You know. So water is polar and lipids are not. So they, they, they generally don't mix here. To get water in, you have to have something, some channel open to a system. The key was unaided. The same with sodium. Sodium doesn't get in unless it has a special channel to go through. The same applies to glucose. Glucose can't get in unless there's a special channel to help it. So we have to have assistance to get certain materials into the cell that the cell needs, but uh, can't normally slide across the membrane. Now there's the phospholipid makeup that we talked about uh, in chapter two. It is a head uh, with a phosphate uh, atom on it, and it had, you know, it's based off of glycerol, because this, this is the phospholipid based off of glycerol, just like the uh, triglycerides are. In fact, there are two of the fatty acids right there. But instead of the third fatty acid, you, you have the phosphate instead. So you have the phosphate and the glycerol and the two fatty acid uh, tails. And they are unsaturated. They are unsaturated fatty acid tails they create the bilayer. There are two layers of these uh, phospholipids. Uh, one layer is faces out with the phosphate head facing out. The other layer faces inward with the phosphate head pointed into the cell. And the fatty acid tails come together 
in the middle. So we have a double layer with the fatty acids in the middle. What it means is that things that are soluble in fat can slide right through. Hormones that are fat soluble like cholesterol can slide right through that membrane. Really tiny molecules like oxygen and, blue and, and uh, carbon dioxide can diffuse through the membrane very easily because they're tiny enough to fit through uh, the membrane, the little tiny gaps they can fit through. Larger molecules can't, particularly if the larger molecules are water soluble. Most proteins are water soluble. Proteins have a hard time coming through the membrane. Water can't go through the membrane. It has to have help. Sodium can't go through the membrane. It has to have help too. And there's your phospholipid bilayer. You see how it's laid out with the heads on the outside, uh, on each end, on each, each side, and the outside layer and the inside layer, intracellular inside the cell, extracellular outside the cell. The tails are pointing towards the middle of the layer. And so you have an outside layer here and an inside layer here. This is fat soluble and water insoluble. We refer to it as hydrophobic, water hating. And the whole membrane looks a lot like this. The cell membrane is a very busy structure. It, uh, it's squishy, it moves up and down. Things float in it and on it and slide through it. Uh, we have proteins embedded in the membrane all over the place. This is a peripheral protein here. It doesn't extend all the way through. Here is an, in an integral protein that goes all the way through the membrane from one side to another. These, are, these integral proteins often function as channels. Here we see a, um, a glycoprotein right here. A glycoprotein is what we call, is what a, that's what a glycocalyx is, uh, a protein with glucose attached to it. Uh, here is a, uh, a glycolipid. It is a fat with a carbohydrate attached to it. Here is cholesterol embedded in the membrane for reinforcing. We have other proteins through here. Uh, all over the, the surface of, of the membrane. Some don't extend all the way through, some do. And the whole thing is squishy, moving up and down. And we call it the fluid mosaic model because it, the surface is, you know, it's a three-dimensional surface. It's a three-dimensional structure where it's constantly sliding across the surface of, of the, you know, of the cell. The, the surface of the cell membrane is constantly in motion. That's so why I you know, picked that water balloon rolled in uh, uh, olive oil and covered with uh, uh, Lucky Charms or Fruit Loops or whatever, something moving around on the surface. So the uh, bilayer is, is mostly is fat. It's mostly uh, phospholipids um, with a little bit of glycolipids on there and about 20% cholesterol. The cholesterol, again, functions as the rebar in concrete. You know what rebar is? Rebar, those iron bars that go into, uh, or steel bars, that go into concrete as it's being poured and it reinforces the strength of the concrete. And so this is what, um, you know, cholesterol does to the cell membrane. It gives the cell membrane its extra strength. So, now the proteins that go through the membrane, uh, they're either an integral protein or a peripheral protein. Integral proteins go all the way through. Peripheral proteins uh, occur on the, on the surface, but don't penetrate through the, through the membrane itself. They can be on the internal surface or they can be in the external surface, but they don't go all the way through. They're usually all very specialized. They can be a channel for water. They can be a, uh, a, a uh, carrier for glucose, but they're not, they're, you know, they're not just you know, sort of a generic type of opening in here. They all serve a specific purpose. 
So the integral proteins will go uh, all the way through. They, they are either a channel protein or a carrier protein. A channel protein is just a tube. It's a like a tunnel through the membrane or a pipe through the membrane. Water passes through channel proteins very easily. If it's a carrier protein, it usually has a very specific shape for unique uh, molecules or ions. You know, the car a specialized carrier protein just for glucose. There's another one just for sodium. There's another one just for potassium and the other ions we need. So these carrier proteins are much more specific. Um, the uh, peripheral proteins are smaller. They generally are associated with the integral proteins. Uh, they work as enzymes. They work as uh, connectors to the cells. Uh, some of them work uh, for uh, allowing proteins to contract and, and relax. Uh, a, a motor protein allowing the cell to change its shape the ability of a cell to, you know, the, like the contractile proteins we saw when a cell was undergoing uh, cell division. You know, uh, actin will slide over top of itself to, to contract. And so uh, it's, a, it's a peripheral protein in that sense. So again, it's not going to pass all the way through. So here are six very busy slides, uh, very busy summaries of what each one of these cells can do, I mean, these proteins can do. They can be transport, they can be receivers for allowing uh, large molecules to communicate with the cell, signal transduction. What that means is, as you'll learn in AP2, hormones are usually too big to get into the cell especially the water-based hormones, well, the, not especially with all the water-based hormones, uh, can't get into the cell. So they have to use a specialized messenger system to get their information into the cell. And so that's what the signal transduction means. You take the signal from the hormone and convert it into some mechanism that will allow it to enter the cell. Not the hormone, just the message. Uh, we see that uh, there are enzymes on the surface of the cell. Um, we see, you know, the, uh, the cell memory is like this giant chemistry lab going on all the time. Membranes, uh, cell membranes are hooked, are joined together. We use these, these proteins to, uh, for joining. We use them for recognizing other cells. And we use the proteins for uh, attaching the uh, member, the cell to other cells or to the, what we call the cytoskeleton that holds them in place. So some examples here. Another example here. And if you are a hormone and you're a protein, you can't get through the cell membrane by yourself. You have to use one of these messengers. And we use a, what we call a second messenger system to tell the cell what to do. Hormones are what we call a chemical messenger. Uh, and we use a second messenger to say, hey, do this, do that. Make more thyroid hormone, make less thyroid hormone, whatever.
You ever wonder why um, the, the tendons are so powerful and are arrayed like they are so that they line up with all these collagen fibers in place? You know, structure, it's a structural protein. Uh, the shape of an axon, it, the, the, the extension of uh, a neuron is held in place by these structural proteins. And here we see Again, you know, enzymes critically important for all cellular activities. So, okay, last point for today: the glycocalyx. You're going to come back, and we'll address this again in AP two and talk about blood typing uh, and the immune system too. The glycocalyx is a sugar and a protein combination. It is a usually called a glycoprotein. Sometimes it's a glycolipid, but this sugar-coated protein, this sugar-coated fat, um, is our identifier as cell. Every every cell in our bodies has the same glycocalyx-type structures on it, and telling us what we are, telling us who we are, and this is very important for cell recognition, and you know like. Um, so that we can identify foreign substances and attack them and destroy them before they cause harm to our bodies. Sometimes we have autoimmune disorders where we attack our own cells. And because we don't recognize the um, uh, glycocalyx on there, it is the lack of a glycocalyx or it's a different glycocalyx than what our immune system is used to that triggers a response for you know, uh, viruses or bacterial infections or even transplanted tissue. So, and which is what I just said. However, cancer cells don't play fair. Cancer cells change their glycocalyx structures constantly so that the immune system can't recognize it. It takes time. It takes about two weeks for a the immune system to respond to a foreign glycocalyx structure. And in that time frame, the cancer cell has changed its glycocalyx around. So every time the immune system responds to a glycocalyx and say, that's a foreign cell, I got to kill it, the cell has changed and it has to start over. Okay. Now, okay, that's where I'll stop and we'll pick up there next Tuesday. Let me get out of here and I will. Um, Get us out of here. It's 11 o'clock. Thank you for being here today. Have a good weekend. And um, as I said, the lab test should end on the 21st, and we'll, I won't start the lecture test until the next day. So, okay. So thank you, and have a good week.